Хабаш Шамаева. Смотрите Кайка ТВ. Это здорово. Vanguard image makers of Kaikov Media get you the positive attention your business deserves. Leading edge graphic designers and printing specialists join to create quality business print, promoting the effective market of your products and services while building you a distinguished professional image. Unique business cards customized to suit individual needs and reflect characteristic style. Postcards are classic advertising. Communicate in full color. Quality brochures from font to finish. We offer value package prices that are almost as attractive as the custom business stationery. Advertise with catalogs, booklets, and pamphlets. Contact us now. Clean and corporate or edgy and trendy. So much to offer that there's not enough time to go over it all with this commercial moving this fast. Get it all at Kaikov Media. Смотрите Кайков ТВ. У вас есть уникальная возможность поздравить своих родных и друзей с помощью нашего телеканала. А также почтить память близких вам людей некрологов. Настройтесь на наш канал и не забудьте выключить радио. Смотрите Кайков ТВ. Hi. 
Welcome to Kaikif TV. My name is Stella Abayev and this is Malka Yagudayev. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I would like to start by having you introduce yourself to our viewers. Hi, I'm Malka Yagudayev and I'm the author of Life Difficult Yet Relatable and Love Driven by Emotions. Now available Barnes & Noble and Amazon.com. So you've written two books. I'll be honest, I haven't read the first, uh, Life Difficult Yet Relatable. Firstly, I want to establish that you are only 20 years old right now and that most 20-year-old women are not twice published authors. Your first book of poetry was only released when you were 19 years old. What was going through your head back then? Well, um, basically I always used to just write to get my thoughts out. Um, I always felt that the best way to express myself was to write. So um, I never ever had any idea that it would turn into a published book. It was just simply, you know, me on my Blackberry writing away and um, it just, the collection grew and I started editing, re-editing and I put together a manuscript and the final product is right there. It's beautiful. Thank I love you. it. Thank you. There's so few contemporary female Baharian poets and only a handful of published Baharian women in America, period. You're paving the way for the next generation of Baharian American youth. What are some of the obstacles that you faced as a pioneer of our literary community? Well, of course, it always goes down to um, trying to branch out and pave the way for everybody else. Uh, it's very difficult when you're in a family and in a culture that, you know, it's, it's difficult that they don't, I'm not saying they don't appreciate literature, but they'd rather it come from other people than from yourself. Do you think they have a reason to feel like, like it's not it's not safe enough? Of course, a hundred percent, because I, I can't blame my parents for uh, being afraid of me not making it or not being successful. So they feel that in America, the most successful people that they see are doctors, are lawyers, and obviously they want me to have a good life. So they want me to go down that road. But at the same time, you know, you have to realize if you have a voice inside of you that's not telling you that that's your, your career, you just, you got to follow what you feel. And that's something I strongly, I strongly believe. Tell us a little bit about your book, Love Driven by Emotions. This book just came out <clears throat> about two, three weeks ago. It is all about the five stages of love, in my opinion. Uh, I feel that love could be broken up, uh, beginning with the butterflies, moving into love, uh, ultimately fading away, then breaking up, unfortunately, then the hope to move on to another which I feel is very strong because a lot of people when they break up they get nervous and they think this is the end I'm never gonna find anybody else but I thought that the best way to end it was to show that there is hope ultimately our perception is reality what you believe is what you're gonna see in your opinion how would you define love I feel that love is a big big word to be tossed around I feel that it's something that you can't pinpoint on, on a definition because everybody feels something else when they think of this four letter word. Whether it be a different scenario, a different thought, a different feeling. I feel that uh, for me personally, I think that love is when two people share something so strong that it's, it's unbelievable. Like You can look at that person and, and see a piece of yourself inside of them and you feel like maybe that person is that missing piece. And it's a beautiful feeling, you know, it always comes with, of course, there's times when you're sad and everything, but it's the whole package. But I feel that love, love could be extremely powerful and moving. So you seem to have a lot of um, emotion when you talk about love. So does this mean you were ever in love? Did you ever experience love? You know, it's, it's a very good question. I, I felt that at the time when I was in a relationship, I did think that I was in love, like everybody else would. You know, you get those feelings. You start thinking, but at the end of it, you, you start to realize that, well, I personally realized that it wasn't love. It was simply a feeling that I wanted to be understood by, you know, the, the person I was dating. And I wanted to feel just that companionship. And I thought that that feeling was love, which is something I soon realized wasn't, but it's okay. Do you have any regrets about your previous relationships? I do not. I believe that each relationship you know, taught me a specific lesson that I had the opportunity to put in the book. Uh, so I look at it as something that was a very good thing. Every relationship, whether it was good or bad, whether it ended or not, it inspired me to write every poem that is in the books. This whole book 
everything that you've experienced. Does this also involve experiences that your friends have gone through, your Definitely. family? Definitely. I, one of my biggest things is I love, I love to be inspired. I love to uh, be able to take the things around me and, and write about it and delve deep into my own thoughts and figure out how I could make my stuff relatable. If you were to single out one of your poems, which one would you choose and consider one of your best works? You know, honestly, I'm proud of every single poem in there. I wouldn't necessarily single one out, but I would say that in each chapter there are certain poems that I am I feel very very strong about. That I feel like the message is there and it would it would get people to really feel what I felt when I wrote it. What are those poems? Well, let's look. It is in chapter one, Butterflies. It's called Accepted. I want to be accepted for who I am, not be myself and feel damned, trying to make excuses and form a plan in order to blend in with the clan and gain the attention of my coveted man. I constantly feel torn between two ideas, the traditional and what I feel is real. Who can truly understand what I feel? Until I find the one, I will have to deal with who I am and who I strive to be trying to break barriers and feel free, all beginning with simply being me. That was a beautiful poem. I can totally relate to it as a Baharian young woman. And um, yeah, I just loved it. Thank I love you. that poem. It's one of my favorites. Thank you very much. Talk more about the Right Now Girl poem. I know it's one of your other personal favorites. What does it say about you as a poet? And what does it say to you as the observer of your own thoughts? I love the Right Now Girl. I think that it is very suitable for uh, people my age and girls that are always torn between feeling that they are the right girl in comparison to guys that necessarily want the Right Now Girl. And what I mean by that is, you know how there's always the Right Now Girl that guys look at that's just, you know, always going to be there. You know, she's, she has nothing in mind for the future. She's just able to give them what they want at the moment. But at the same time, in that poem, I kind of go back and forth to what the right now girl is with like, you know, lost and infatuated with uh, and then bringing it back to the right girl who's just waiting on the side as a potential wife token, you know, completely broken. Um, and I feel like it's, it's very, it's, it just, it sucks. <laughs> I don't know. I what think it. a lot of girls our age can relate to that. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's something that, you know, everybody goes through one way or another, whether you want to or not. Uh, I was surprised because I actually got that comment from a boy and it just, it threw me off track. It, that inspired me to write that. It was just like, listen, Malka, you're the right girl, but not the right now girl. I'm like, wait, hold on a second. Let me take out my Blackberry and just figure this out. But um, it did, it really, it, it, I'm not saying it hurt me, but it just, at a certain point, it made me think twice about my values and what I chose to be in life and in the path that I put myself on because you know he, it's always questioned when you know you, you want a guy and he's not into the right now thing he's uh, not into the right thing into the right now thing mm -hmm. it's just it's it's a big mess one poem that stands out in my own head is a night of lust firstly because it's very candid about sexuality as you know in the Bukharian community they don't like to talk about that so it's very, very um, detailed, the poem. It's very vivid, and it describes an encounter with a male and a female uh, who were at a club. They seek out a one-night stand. They find it. They get it done. No guilt, no second date, no misunderstanding, no confusion. Wanted to yeah, go to sleep with their lust-filled eyes. Yes, and I was about to say that. Yes. I, I ended off that poem with uh, putting, finally putting to rest my lust-filled eyes. I feel that, you know, one of the stages of love, whether a person wants it or not, there's going to be a point where lust plays a big picture. It plays a big role in the picture. And um, it's where people have to realize the difference. It's, it's one of the emotions that they're driven by. You know, when sometimes people feel like it's the right emotion, but once again, it's up to them to decide that they have to sit there and think about it, that it's not. And I feel that in One Night of Lust, I portray the typical story in a club where a guy would come in, a girl would come in, they just want to have fun, and they do, and end the story. That's the right now girl. You are very brave for putting it out there. I'm kind of surprised that, you know, you were just bold enough to write that. So 
What are your expectations about getting, uh, about the feedback that you're going to receive? What do you think is going to come out? Well, I obviously cannot please everybody, but I do feel like the readers will be able to relate to the material at one point or another. And at that point, that's when I'll feel like my work is complete. That as, as an author, my platform is to gain an audience that want to feel understood, want to feel related to, like be able to relate to. And I think that's very important, whether in any chapter of the book, they could just skim through and feel what they're feeling, whether they're going through a breakup or you know they, they just lost somebody and they just want to get some insight or whatever it may be. I feel that it's very important to be able to you know pick something up and feel understood through somebody else's words. I think that it's, it's a very powerful, powerful, I don't even know how to explain it. It's just, it's a powerful feeling that, you know, words are extremely powerful and it depends how, what you do with them, how you utilize it. And I feel like I did it to the best of my ability. I think you did too. Thank you. Um, do you feel like most Baharian women are not open and honest enough about their sexuality and their love lives? Well, I definitely think that they do hold back a lot, but it's also because how we were raised is to uh, fear what people are going to think. What are people going to say if you step out of the line, if you, if you want to go out till a certain time or you want to go see a certain concert, whatever the situation may be. People always instilled fear in us to step out of the box, to do what we want to do, to say what we want to say. And of course, that goes deep into when people want to discuss their, their love life or what they, what they want to do within a relationship. And it's, it's horrible because I strongly stand on the fact that everybody should be able to express themselves. It makes people easier, like it makes breathing easier when you don't bottle up and you just you, you live a little bit like lighter. You just, you feel like I have nothing to be ashamed of. I have nothing to be afraid of. You feel something, say it. You want to do something, do it. That's it. In your view, are we too old fashioned or too uptight? I honestly feel that it's based on the individual. I think that anybody could break the mold. Anybody could do anything. I was raised in a very old fashioned uh, family. You know, my parents were a lot older than I was, so they obviously hold tighter to the, to the traditions that they were raised by. I feel that it was up to me to show them how to modernize and how to, how to show that it's okay to live this kind of a life where you're just a little bit more free, you could do stuff like this, and you can get rewarded for it. And it's, it's a very good feeling. I think it's up to the person. Should there be more open dialogue about sex and speaking to their children about sex or explaining to them? Because you see, I know that with American families, they're very open. They talk, they have a certain, like you see in shows. The birds and right, bees conversation. Who, right, yeah. who wants, which parent wants to talk to their child about sex? I don't really see that. Uh, in Baharian families, you, you know, know, like you see. I agree TV. with you. I agree with you. Uh, growing up, I also I wanted because you know we watch TV when we when we grow up and we see how the Americans treat their children, and I think that's when we start feeling a little bit confused as to how we're being raised and how we see on TV how other people are being raised, and I think it's it brings a, upon a, like a doubt and, and a worry that why can't we be like that. I'm not saying that Bukharians are bad, they have an amazing culture, tradition, a tight-knit family. They, they promote a lot of good things, but I think in raising children, uh, they should really try to a little bit change it up so children aren't afraid to open up to their parents, right. you know, whether it be about sex, whether it be about drugs, whatever the, the situation may be. I just think that they should be able to create that fine line that just they should be open, they should trust it. It's just, uh, I think, lack of trust. Right, right. You know, because uh, Bukharians are afraid that, you know, the, their children are going to go off the path and whatever it is, so they kind of just try to be all strong and show them that it's not okay. Right. But I think, I think they should. They should kind of blur the lines and bring their children a little closer to them. Do you feel as Baharian women that we should be able to express ourselves sexually the same way that Baharian men are able to express themselves? There's a double standard. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? I feel that as much as we would want to be accepted as much as guys are in our culture, I think that it's never going to happen. I just think that as women, we should stand by what we feel is right and what we want to do and, and make it happen. I don't think that we should be comparing ourselves to another gender because that has been a whole nother conversation. 
you know, like in and of itself with the feminist movement and all that. I, I don't think we need that. I just think that if girls want to, you know, write something or they want to be somebody, they want to model, whatever they want to do, I think that their passion should be, they should be driven by it. They should be able to, to be somebody without having to worry that their culture is going to stop them. Uh, some readers, particularly the more conservative members of our community, might be shocked or even offended that a young Baharian, unmarried girl, is discussing love, sex, and relationships. What do you say to reassure those readers? I feel that I'm only expressing my voice and I'm not brainwashing anybody. I'm not, I'm not doing anything other than expressing my own thoughts and feelings and that, that's me being me. And I feel that if they can't accept that and they, they're afraid of, of a movement where people would be able to follow their dreams and follow their passions, I think that's a great movement. But if, if they're afraid that I'm like messing up what they've been having for so many years in their traditions, I, I'm not going to say I'm sorry to that. I'm just being me. And I feel that it's very important for people to, you know, follow their dreams, do what they want to do. Why should they be afraid? Do you consider yourself a role model for Baharian young girls? I don't, but I think after this I will. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't look at myself as anything other than being me. And if I would be more than honored if, if, you know, younger girls would come up to me and say that, you know, I've, I've inspired them or they can relate to my material. That makes me feel that this job is worthwhile. And um, it's a feeling that it's just, it's, it's amazing. And uh, I'm very blessed that with my words, I can, I can touch people's hearts because there's one line that I follow and it's uh, words from the heart enter the heart. And that's something that I truly believe. In what ways are your poems a positive contribution to the community? I think that it could open up people's eyes. Sometimes not everybody could express themselves. Sometimes people feel something and they don't know how to put it into words. And a lot of the times people, when people read my poems, a lot of the feedback I get is, that's exactly what I was thinking or that's exactly what I was feeling. And it, it feels good because you know not everybody could express themselves, whether in rhyme or whether just writing essays, whatever it is, you know, everybody has their own talents. But I feel that I do a good job at, you know, um, focusing on one certain aspect of it, of, of any problem, of, any, of anything. Like, let me show you in the book. Let's just go to the first book. Um, let's just say we're going to talk about uh, you f you're in a relationship and you feel that it's kind of slipping away and you feel like maybe you were just a phase. And it's such a hurtful feeling, but at the same time, I sat down and I felt like I was just a phase for somebody that I really cared about. And I'd like to read that because I think okay. that it's, it's something that people could relate to. All right, it's called I Was Just a Phase from Life Difficult Yet Relatable. I was just a phase, a bridge, if you may, that linked you her way, begged you to stay, kneel down and pray, just remember yesterday. I was just a phase, loved you in every way, Gave you all that I had, at times got mad, which led to feeling sad. I was just a phase, caught up in a craze of love and romance. Just wanted a chance to be given a shot, knowing we all have flaws, we are not robots. I was just a phase, wanted to be praised only for the love that I have given up. Gave no chance to another, did not look and would not bother. You were my lover, I wanted no other. I was just a phase. These doubts created a maze, hidden deep in my mind. The truth I cannot find. What do I truly seek? I do not know, but I am too afraid to take a peek. I was just a phase, knowing you as my only, never feeling lonely with you by my side, being held tight under your warm wing, with my eyes watering. Right when the doubts were shattering, you get up and begin to leave. I was just a phase. Those are some amazing words you do have a thank way you, thank you. <laughs> of getting in touch with people's hearts it's something that i feel that it's it's a word it's such a horrible feel i remember where i was when i wrote it i just i felt so like i just got slapped in the face for a minute and i needed to just to, to dig deep and get those emotions out and put it on paper mm -hmm. and that's one of my favorite favorite poems because i think that it's it's so raw it's so real in your view what don't outsiders understand about us as Baharian American women? I think that they don't understand that in our culture uh, we have a very strong emphasis on having a tight-knit family, a tight-knit community and, and all being unified, which is beautiful. But at the same time, in 
that whole picture, the women play a huge role in making that happen. How? They have to cook, they have to clean, they have to go to school, balance out a career, balance out whatever it is that they have to do. And it's so difficult because everything you hear is just, you know, you go to school, you graduate high school, sometimes you get married right out of high school or first year in college. There's no, there's no gap for people to take a break and learn about who they are, what they like to do. And I feel that it's so important. It's so important to you know, have a year to yourself, have two years to yourself while you're out getting to know yourself. Because how can you let somebody love you if you don't love yourself, if you don't know what you stand for? You know, because with Baharians, we're, we're raised a certain way to believe certain things. And there comes a time where you start questioning what you believe. And I think you shouldn't just keep following the norm, but you should kind of take a break, you know, kind of just step out for a second and figure out yourself. And then if you want, step back into it. If not, then create your own path. In your experience, what don't the Baharian men understand about us? I think that it's very difficult for them to understand this movement of women being able to have a say, have a voice, make a difference in the world, uh, especially from our culture. Like you see people in the American community, they make differences day in and day out. And that's, that's okay. That's something that is acceptable because we see it so often. But when somebody from our own, it, it kind of feels like, wait, 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 what's going on? Like, right. eh, this is something strange, but it's actually something beautiful. And I think that a lot of people should try to figure themselves out and try to make a difference, starting with our community and then working our way up. If you could change one thing about our Baharian system of values, what would you change? I would change the idea and the emphasis on being afraid of what other people have to say. That is something that bothers me so much because, you know, before I, I got into these projects, that was something that I was dealing with. You know, when I went to my family and I said that I want to write a book, I like poetry. They look at it like, what are people going to say? You're supposed to be a doctor. You're supposed to, you're supposed to do, like, you know, things that would be with an MD at the end of your last name. But it's something you realize that... Um, it's so hard to, to branch out from it, but I feel that if you're persistent, if you're motivated and driven, you're gonna get the results you want. And it's just a matter of time, it's a matter of staying strong, you know, even with all that chaos and, and you know, being afraid of what people think. I think that to some degree you should just, you should be afraid by your, by, for, your, for yourself, where you should know what you want, what you stand for, and you should know yourself. You shouldn't have to sit there and prove anything to anybody or be afraid because whether you give somebody something to talk about or you don't, they're always going to have something to talk about. So might as well follow your heart and give them the real thing to talk about. What are the things you love most about our way of life in our community, our culture, um, the things that you would never want to change? I absolutely love how in a matter of whether a happy occasion or a bad occasion, everybody comes together. We're, we're a very unified uh, culture, and I love that. On top of that, the food is just amazing. And it's something that the, uh, the, you know, the generations before us, however they came up with it, thank you, God. And you know, it's something that I feel that it's very, it's very good to come home and have like a, a hot meal waiting for you as opposed to you know, how Americans do it or anybody else, how it's just like fast food all the time. I feel that our culture is, is very, very, it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful concept as to what they want to hold on to. And, you know, that rock that they have from, from thousands of years ago, we have to continue it, but we could just mold it into something else. You know how they say in Baharian families, um, why are you going to always eat outside? Just go home and eat. Exactly. They always have that. It's like you will hear that in every Baharian family yep. household and all that. Because the poor mom is in the kitchen all day. Why yeah. would you go to fast food? Exactly. Just go home and eat. Do you believe our traditional values will survive in America? Yes. I think that as long as, you know, there's certain things you could believe. I think that not, maybe not necessarily every single traditional value, but most of them, I think most of them will do it. They've done it this far for this long, why not? I think that you know each of us are raised with something that we will continue on. I want my kids to be raised, obviously, with the Bukharian um, culture and, and values and stuff, but in a modernized American type of mentality. And I think that that's, that's a very good mix. I'd be very happy. Would you allow them to be with other um, cultures? Would you let I, them assimilate? You know, 
I, as long as the Judaism aspect remains, like I would want them to marry a Jew, you know, just, you know, of course it's easier. Like personally, I would want to marry like a, a modernized Bukharian because I feel that I wouldn't want to be thrown into that primitive society and then I'd be the culprit because my mentality isn't there. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, if my children would do the same thing, because it's easier, you know, you, you have the same values, you, you understand each other, you know, the language is, is there, it's, it's just easier to be with somebody that you have a similar background. Right, right. It just makes life a lot easier, in my opinion. Are we as free as American women in choices for ourselves and for our future? That's, that's a serious one. <laughs> I, it's a yes and no answer to me. I think that to some degree, yes, you know, we have our own choices, but there are certain parents that are more strict that would, let's just say, that would bring home a guy for their daughter to marry or for them to, to see. And then let's just say there was a family they really liked, they'd be pushing on it more. I think that girls have a say, but not as much as the family, as the older brothers, as the older people. Like, I think they try to kind of nurture the silence. Um, do you feel like our, our generation of Baharian women doing better with love and relationships than our mom's generation? Definitely, most definitely. My mother was forced into an arranged marriage at 16 oh, wow. years old. And it's something that, you know, she always, always tells me. Like, she always has tears in her eyes when she talks about this. She always says that I never had love growing up, she says. You know, with, with, she never had luck with her husband and everything like that. And she goes, I wish that you have that luck that I didn't have. You know, and it's something that it's, it's so, I hold it so deep to my heart that that's why I don't, I don't look at marriage as an easy thing. Like there's people that right out of high school get married and they love each other and all that. They've been dating for two months. I think it's ridiculous. So it's still alive, you're saying? I think, I think it's still alive to a certain degree. And I, I think that, you know, love and relationships and marriage are such a holy, holy thing that, you know, these days everybody's throwing it around. Like it's, it's, it's like it's, it's in style to get married at 17, to, to have kids by your, before you're 19, I, I don't know. That's not something I, I, I vouch for. It's not something I would want. How does it feel to be among the first Baharian women of your generation to be a published author in a conservative community? It feels really good. It honestly feels as though I am on the right track in life, that I'm following my own voice, I'm trying to make a difference, I'm trying to gain an audience that, from a culture where they always feel that they have no voice, that they have no say. I want them to be able to hear their own voice through my writing, to feel related to, that they're not alone. There's so many other people that feel the same way. Right, they're in just, their same culture. Exactly, they just don't talk about it. Right. So that's the beauty of it. So what message, what advice can you give to young Baharian women who are struggling between assimilation, tradition, you know, we're in America, so you're definitely going to bump into that. I think that to a certain degree, it's very, very, very important, very vital for yourself to really, really think about what you want to do. What kind of life do you want to live? What kind of people do you want to be around? Where do you see yourself working every day? It's something that you want to wake up and just be, smile about instead of wake up and be like, oh, I have to go downtown, take three trains and a bus to go to my accounting job. It's like, why did you choose it? Oh, my dad is an accountant, my grandfather was an accountant, I have to follow those footsteps. But on the side, that person loves dance, let's just say. Mm -hmm. Follow your heart, you know, do what you want to do. Sometimes it's not all up. It's, people always associate it with money, and that's such a big problem because, you know, as much as they say, money doesn't make you happy. It's, it's when you follow your passion, trust me, when you follow your passion, whether you're getting money or not, it's the best feeling in the world because you're unique, you follow your own voice, you don't follow the crowd, you, you kind of set up your own thing and you attract other people to do the same. It has to start with somebody. But I do have to say what most Baharian parents say is, trust me, once you see the money, you're going to love the job. A hundred percent. My parents said the same thing. I had a scholarship in St. John's uh, for the PA program right after high school and I didn't want to do it. But I got accepted and it, it, just, it just happened to a point where my parents were just like, oh, they called the whole family all over the world. My daughter, four years, is going to be a physician's assistant this close to a doctor. And I was just like, I, I was going along with that. I was like, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe the money would make me happy, maybe. But I always doubted it. And I think that once you realize, if you're doubting a certain career, maybe it's not for you. Maybe that's when you have to realize, whoa, what do I like doing? And... It was, it was very difficult because 
I had my whole family up for this. So I had four years and my life was set. And here I am, I left the scholarship. I went to another school. I took a semester off. I felt too confused. I felt too overwhelmed with trying to make a decision, trying to figure out what do I want to do? And the answer came when I took a break and I had time to look at myself and mm -hmm. look at what are my hobbies, what do I do? And here it is. What is the feedback so far about your book, Love, Driven by Emotions? What the are you feedback, to? The feedback has been amazing. It's, it's, it's overwhelming to hear how many people understand what I want to say and understand what I feel and feel understood. And it's just, it's, it's all happiness. It's, it's, it's a very good feeling. I'm very, very happy. Um, plans are to really market, try to get it out there, you know, speaking at schools, um, marketing on Facebook, whatever it may be, just to try to get it out there. Word of mouth is the best, mm -hmm. the best marketing tool you could I say. Um, but that's really it, just to try to get as many people that feel what I feel. I would like to close with your babula. You dedicated it to your grandma. Why did you dedicate it to her and what was the memorable experience Please share the story with us. Um, I was raised uh, with my grandma. She lived with us. It was it was great because my mom was always on tour. She was dance. She was a dancer, so she was always dancing. My dad, my dad uh, was always working, and so it was just it was good, you know, to be raised by somebody that lived with you and everything. Long story short, she uh, she had a stroke. And um, she still lived with us. We never put her in a home, nothing. Always took care of her. Um, then she, due to her diabetes, she had, she had gangrene. And so we put her under hospice care. And hospice took a great deal of care. You know, they got us prepared for what was going to happen. Uh, I was 15, and I went to go visit her. And I walk in, and, you know, she's just laying there. It's just strange, you know, because it's to grandma. <laughs> And so I went up, you know, she wasn't really talking, but um, I was, yeah, she, she, she held my hand and I just looked at her, you know, and I, I loved her, she was my rock, she was everything I knew, she, she raised me. And, and, you know, for a second she just closed her eyes and I looked at my parents and I was like, oh wow, she fell asleep, you know, I'm 15. I thought, wow, she fell asleep. And then, you know, they called the doctors in and whatever and at 12.15 they pronounced her dead. And, you know, that moment just changed me for the rest of my life because here it was, the person that meant the world to you just passed in front of your eyes. And there's nothing I could, there's nothing I could do to stop it. Just, I was looking at somebody that I had memories with and, and I, I bear her name. Yeah, I'm named after her. And I just, I always felt such a connection and it threw me off that... There's nothing I could do. She just she just left right in front of me, and I think at that pivotal moment in my life, I I don't I didn't realize it then, but I see it now. That that changed me. That changed my perception on life, on love, on on so many different things, because in an instant, somebody could just leave right in front of you, and there's nothing you could do about it. And I think that's why I started cherishing those around me. I started living life to the fullest. In in, in what way? Just just by every day doing things that. In my mind, I would just do, just not to push aside because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know if the person that means the world to you, something could happen to her or just anything simpler than that. And I think that is what changed my mentality. I think that's what changed how I perceive so many things in life. I look at life differently after that. And I'm so happy that I get to share that with everybody and, and hopefully inspire people to live the same way. And even with anything, you could take it to relationships that, you know, with the right now girl, let's just say, you know, somebody that wouldn't cherish that girl, put her aside, you know, just to have some fun. But then you miss out, you miss out on the person and there's nothing you could do to get them back because every, everything has a time. We're all timed. That's why here in, in life, I specifically put the, the clock on top of the eye because I think that we're all timed. No matter what happens, no matter... No matter what, we're all timed here. And it's something that, you know, I have to live with. It's something that I used to dwell on so much, but it, it did, it made me who I am today. And I'm very happy and, you know, forever I will always be thankful that she taught me how to love. She taught me, she taught me so much. But on top of everything, obviously, I just wish that I had her here to see what I'm doing now, to see how everything just unfolds. But 
maybe that had to happen for a reason that, you know, there's nothing I could do about it. But it, 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 it changed my life. That was so intense. How do you think your first appearance was on Kaikuf TV? I think it was a huge milestone. I'm very, very proud and honored that I had the opportunity to speak my mind and speak the books here at Kaikuf TV. Well, Malcolm, I thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you. Um, congratulations. I hope you're going to go big, and I hope you're going to make a lot of Baharian women realize it's okay to open up and they sh that you should actually encourage that. And I'm glad that you do. Um, I definitely am a big fan of your book. Thank I'm you. about to purchase this one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so um, much. I really appreciate it. I loved being here on KTV and, you know, to be able to share my thoughts on so many things that are from the past, you know, my thoughts on the future and, and just be able to speak my mind. It's, it's, it's a beautiful feeling. Thank you very much. Thank you. С вами Стар Сегаль. Смотрите Кайков ТВ. Кайков ТВ. Мы поможем вам стать успешными. А вас узнают все. Успешные люди. Успешный бизнес. Кайков ТВ.